We make, I mean, it helps to make one motion, but we discuss discussion. One, one, yeah. yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So let's start with December 13th. Any questions or comments about that? Uh, January 10th. Yeah, I think, yeah, that was a January 10th meeting, and uh, there was one change in, on the page that, uh, I think it's the last page, that had the committee assignments, so one of them had Grover on it, so uh, we're changing that to Kelly, because that's what was decided at the meeting. Oh, for the OES? Yeah. Okay. All right, okay. All right, and no questions or comments on that. How about the January 24th uh, minutes? Comments or questions on those, okay. All right, seeing none from the council. It, <laughs> did you want to say something? No. I'm sorry. <laughs> you got the gestures now, so. Um, so let me open to public comments. Are there any public comments with regard to the minutes from the, either of those three meetings? All right, I see no public comments or corrections on those. I'm going to accept the minutes for all, all three months. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. All right, so we're moving right along. Now we are at uh, staff report, or excuse me, council reports. So this is our committee assignment. So uh, let me go, I guess, from left to right. So Jack West, do you have anything you want to read? Right. And I'll, I'm going to start by apologizing to everybody. We had what looked like a great trail committee meeting coming up last week. And unfortunately I got too sick to head the meeting. And so we decided to back out of it. Just seeing that we're doing some nice things and we will be meeting as soon as I come up with a new day and get back to all the things we're working on. Uh, I have um, a short HCOG report. We've uh, just so you know, if you've noticed by going by the um, Gentile area turnoff, um, excuse me, the, um, <clears throat> the work on the Eureka Corridor, I uh, noticed that trees have been cut down. So the first step in the overpass um, <clears throat> in, from between Eureka and Arcata is being done, and it will be continuing in spring. We're going to begin to actually see the work that <clears throat> to create the overpass and the trail that goes from Breakout right to Eureka. <laughs> And the overpass to Indianola. So that is all in the works, and you're beginning to see the actual work being done, and it still hopefully be done in 2023, possibly. And downtown Eureka is on a big move between 2023 and 2025. You'll see a lot of activity. The one thing that's going to take a long time is the part of your anything from uh, Indianola to Eureka right now where the trail is going to go in. They are uh, going to be replacing the slough bridge and uh, both those bridges that go to Eureka, it's about a $130 million project. So they haven't got the funding yet. So that is hopefully going to be done in 2029 or 2030. But there's lots of changes through the Broadway area in Eureka. So keep your eyes open and you can go to ACOG to find out more information if you're interested. Thank you. Yeah, the Humble Transit Authority continues to make uh, great strides towards bringing um, a fully electric and or hydrogen bus fleet to the county. Um, we're actually a leader in the state in a lot of the efforts, um, including developing um, right now. <laughs> this is ironic, right? We have to pay a ton of money in diesel to ship hydrogen fuel to the county uh, because the nearest production site for, for hydrogen is in Sacramento. Um, so we're working on a, on a hydrogen production site in the county. Um, and so we're just, we're making great strides um, in bringing all of this to, to the county. So that's really encouraging. My meeting with REDEC, uh, the Redwood Region Economic Development Corporation, um, didn't, we just did some sort of in-house kind of business this month. So nothing really to report out. And then I can share that, um, I'm still working on getting connected to the Arcata Ambassador Program. And so I will give an update as soon as um, my schedule and the city manager's schedule for Arcata um, can coincide. So please keep keep looking for those updates in the future. Thank you. Do you want to go ahead? No, I have nothing to report, okay. except that the committee that you just mentioned, the mm -hmm. uh, that Shell is going to be your second. Right. Okay. Good. Thank you. 
All right, I just have a couple of quick ones. I attended the Humboldt Waste Management Authority meeting on the 9th of February. So this, um, you know, was mainly centered on the new state law about composting and organic selection. And so uh, they covered off on regional organic selection and processing primarily. They shared a new video that they have. Um, if anyone's interested in the Humboldt Waste Management Authority, it's pretty good. It kind of shows the whole history and everything. Uh, but the most important thing, I think the most salient thing for Trinidad is the estimated uh, time frame for this summer to be able to, for them to have the collection facility in place so that you can either drop off organic waste um, or they will have a pickup service. But the pickup service is going to be uh, Humboldt Sanitation and Recycling. And I called them today. They don't have a time frame just yet. So even though Humboldt Waste Management Authority we should have the collection center available in the summer. Um, there may be a bit of a lag before Humboldt Sanitation has the pickup service. So meanwhile, keep composting uh, on your own if you can. And then the other thing was the Water Advisory Committee. We had that last week. Um, the uh, WAC or Water Advisory Committee, we thanked Eli and Phil. We all took a tour of the water plant, the city councilors and the planning commissioners all toward the water plant, and so that was really useful. Uh, but what we spent a bit of time on was talking about some things that are in the budget today, about the plant management through the contractor Coleman Engineering. Uh, we also reviewed the agreement with Pacific Watershed Associates and some of the work they're doing to look for raw water storage for the city. Uh, we, let's see, we also discussed whether to continue to have the Water Advisory Committee outside of the City Council, and it was unanimous that we should continue the work because we can go deep on water topics, and some of those future topics will be water conservation and water sourcing, like great water catchment, and also the quality of the city's water, so, uh, so that was pretty much, and then I think the only other thing is that we had uh, three of the counselors attended ethics training last week, so that was a good refresh for us that we do every two weeks. That's it. And um, we should talk about our next Yes. So Cheryl and I, um, I know it's not kind of a nice intro, but we should talk. <laughs> yes, <about that>. please. <laughs> I forget there's people in the room sometimes. <laughs> so Cheryl and I um, and our city planner, Trevor, and our city manager, Eli, uh, met with the Rancheria and our government-to-government -government, um, efforts, um, really uh, resuming meetings that we held pre-pandemic. Um, uh, we we just got out of the sequence of, of meeting with folks. So it was mostly just sharing updates about um, efforts that they're doing with their stormwater or um, let's see the first one. Oh, the, uh, there's uh, a proposed that will come to the council for for more discussion, but a proposed land swap of a tiny little parcel from the rancher city to the rancheria on one side of the harbor, and then the opposite transfer, or another transfer in the opposite direction, both benefiting the city and the rancheria. Um, instead of easements, it'll be a small property transfer, so equal amounts of property. So we just discussed activities that are going on in each of our areas. They had a new, a couple new counselors. We had a couple new counselors. So it's just nice to to bring those discussions back. Yeah, I don't know if I encapsulated it all. Yeah, I think the only other thing we talked about was some um, continued desire on the part of the rancheria to to uh, source water for their uh, new project, and you know, uh, continued discussion with uh, Humble Bay Municipal Water District, but also with the city of Trinidad. So more to come on that. I thought one more thing I want to add. Yes. Yeah. I just want to let you all know, thank you for all of you that missed the last meeting because we didn't have one. It was a Valentine Hall and it was a very successful night. And just wanted to, it was very nice that we could get out of the city council and we could use this for a fundraiser. And um, and, and, and by the way, the ranch and was Jackie was there. Patty made a great presentation. So it was a really nice event. So if you I'm sorry. They'll continue to have it, so come in and have a good time with them in the town hall. These kinds of activities for the community. Excellent. Did you guys have heat? Sad. Did you have heat? Yeah. Well, did we have heat? Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just check. Well, that was important. Yeah, just checking. That would be an unfortunate. <laughs> so, um, all right, staff report. So we let minute. Yeah, I'll turn it over for law enforcement to Lieutenant Josh McCall, who's on the Zoom call. 
Hey, good evening. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yes. All right. Perfect. So I know it's the uh, last day of February. I don't have the February stats, but uh, I'm looking at January's. <clears throat> Excuse me. So overall for January, I had 202 calls for service in the uh, city and greater Trinidad area. Out of that, there was 13 reports taken, five arrests were made, four felony investigations, and four misdemeanor investigations. Uh, there was three assaults, with one of those being uh, related to a domestic violence, one burglary, one vandalism, one general theft, uh, eight general disturbances, a couple of trespass slash prowler suspicious person calls, and then one uh, stolen vehicle or recovery out of that. As far as... Uh, the other general calls, we had five alarms, six uh, business checks or patrol checks conducted by deputies uh, in general. Um, suspicious persons were three calls or vehicles, uh, one shots heard or possible fireworks, and then four traffic stop vehicle investigations with a total of 165 other miscellaneous calls that don't uh, fall into those, those categories. So if there's any questions or comments uh, from the council and then also the public, and just a special note, because we do have some people in the public that we normally don't have, uh, the report covers the greater Trinidad area. So a large part of the activity is actually in the county area beyond the city. limits. So I have a question, but I don't know if Josh will know the answer to this, but um, is, I noticed that the crime heat map is different from the report that we get from you. Is it, it seems like there are less things on the crime heat map. Do you have any idea why there's a disparity in that data or is it? Uh, I'm sorry, the I'm on my I'm on my laptop and the volume's not as, as high as I'd like to be to to uh, to which which were you referring to? We have a, there's a Humboldt County Sheriff's Department heat map and you can go there and okay. see all the reports. Yeah. Through the and citizen like citizen rims. Yeah. Do you know yeah, why? so sure. I'm going to guess if you're looking at the numbers look less than that. Yes. Yes, because that usually I think, um, and I'm I'm not super um, tech savvy with that whole that whole system of that, but I know that's a limited number of days that does it is. So these are stats for the entire month of January. Whereas if you were to pop on the the that map for today, I think that only basically looks at uh, depending on the date range you set up to the last uh, week or so. Any other questions? Um, are we done with, we're done with counselors? Any other questions? Counselors? Okay, open to the public comments, please. Um, I have uh, Anita first and then Patty. Sorry, Patty. She was on her way. Hello, Anita. I just wanted to thank you for summarizing the details of the activity. Of course. Okay. Thank you for appearing. Because we had a question. I wondered if your report of the 202 calls for the vandalism. Um, officer had anything to do with the uh, breaking of the windows at the library and the museum and the post office and I've heard yeah. Murphy's as well. Was that in the report and do you know anything about that? <laughs> So the the stats I'm looking at, which is the the same form that's basically sent to the city by the um, uh, staff at the at the McKinleyville station, doesn't specify what any of these specific incidences are. Um, if that was the case in January and there was a bunch of windows broken, um, of multiple businesses, especially in the same, you know discovered at the same time or occurring at the same time and it was probably taken under one report so if that occurred in january and that was the what was called report that's probably yes. what that one vandalism is referring to it was february actually last week okay so no that one wouldn't be in here because again i know today's the, the last day of the month but we didn't have the she didn't have these stats compiled yet for february so this is all january's stats um I don't know what day that's news to me as far as all those those uh, that being broken. Um, definitely look into it when I'm back in the office. But yeah, this is the first that, that I personally have have heard of it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Patty. That's a good question. I saw that on mentioned on next door. So, all right. Other questions or comments? Right, I don't see any other, so thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lieutenant Paul.
Uh, so as far as the city manager's report, number one, the website, uh, I signed the contract last week. It was sent to Civic Plus. Uh, they will be working on our website update and revision and, and hosting. And it should be available sometime in the spring is what we're hoping for. And then uh, the stormwater project has a monitoring well that'll happen in the harbor March 6th, beginning in the morning and hopefully ending close to noon. Uh, will be the drilling for the monitoring well. It will be done through an auger drill, which will uh, basically have a certain number of blows that can be heard in the near vicinity. We're notifying all residents west of Trinity Street. So basically anything heading down from Trinity towards the harbor, uh, the bus any businesses and residents will be notified to anticipate that sound. I know if I lived in that area, I might just find something else to do and go somewhere. Uh, the uh, water plant uh, with the turbidity, of course, that's always a challenge. And then the power outages creates another challenge because the uh, power, I mean, the water plant rather has to be reset every time that the power goes out. Now we applied for Measure C funding. Uh, so I'll update you as that uh, moves along. Uh, we're uh, requesting money for the Community Ambassador Program and for Pacific Coast Security. And, and then uh, if we can get additional on-the-ground uh, deputies from the sheriff, then uh, we could possibly use that as part of the reports. Our audit was completed for 2021-2022. And... Uh, the TOT revenue for this past quarter was up, even though compared to last year, uh, even though it was at eight percent, that there was more activity happening this past year in 2022 than in 2021. And then just a reminder for all uh, STRs and uh, our BNB that April 1st the new TOT rate will increase to 12 percent. And uh, as far as the water loss, it actually went up again this year. I mean, this month, it keeps fluctuating, but uh, it's at 20.65. So ideally, as long as we can keep it 20% and below, we're okay with that. And that's all I have. I'll entertain any comments or questions. You like, can I get a, or can we, and I know this is kind of off the cuff, but any updates on the rainwater catchment? You mentioned the stormwater project and how it was able to fund this rainwater catchment. Is there any update on how that's progressing over at the school? Yeah, the, there's nothing really new at the moment. Okay. Uh, and then a, a GHD is also working on plans for that. Oh, okay. So that's the current stage. All right, thanks. Well, I have a question. Uh, on the stormwater monitoring well, uh, exactly what does that mean? Well, uh, the state requires through the water board uh, requires all the stormwater that runs off and it's going now into the harbor from the city. They want us to monitor the water there uh, and, and determine certain things that are in the water that are coming from the stormwater in the city and going into the harbor. And they also want to monitor the uh, groundwater in the harbor area to make sure that uh, once the water reaches the ocean, and the bay, it's not, uh, you know, having certain pollutants. All right, any questions on the staff report from the public? Please, Ms. Thompson. Oh. The city manager, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so we don't we don't know why the water loss increased by almost fifty percent from. Yeah, well, it, and and it decreased the last month by uh, like quite a bit from twenty four to ten. Ten was actually an anomaly, I think. Yeah, generally speaking, it it runs between fifteen and twenty percent generally. So uh, uh, Gabe actually prepared this uh, report on that page. Do you have any 
I've heard it say. Yes, but you're just looking at the trend for yeah. next month. Yeah, we look at the overall loss at the end, like an annual average. Yeah. And that's where we end up with our 20, between 15 and 20% water loss, which is a, let's Except call it a, a good, an average number for a municipal system. Um, but it's, we've, we've tried, we've been trying to figure this out for so many years, whether it's the time that they start reading, if they read, like if they finish like a day later, mm -hmm. if they read the master meter first, by the time they get to the end of the route, people have already used water since we read the first master meter. So there's all kinds of different formulas that they've tried to take and we still haven't really narrowed it down yet, but we think that has a lot to do. Sometimes it'll take them a day and a half to read and so much water is being passed through meters by the time they read that first master meter. So we have some answers, we just don't have, you know, the exact science. Thank you for explaining it. Thank you. And I, I assume that um, it sounds like, uh, from what Mayor Kelly said that you're going to discuss the staffing for the um because I didn't attend the water advisory committee, you're going to discuss that in more detail, Coleman staffing and what's going on right now with the uh, water plant staffing uh -huh. running it. Are we going to discuss that later? Or? Well, it, it's not on the agenda, but I could just comment a little bit. Would you? So, yeah. Uh, so uh, COVID engineering with Bill Gottman will continue for the time being to be our chief plant operator. And then we do have uh, one T3, uh, John Genesco, and one T2, uh, Lyle Lowry. And uh, they're, they're working at the plant. And then Bill comes in from Roseville uh, twice a month uh, to uh, just oversee and so on. Yeah, but that's the current status right now. Um, so we're we're trying to uh, possibly get other things going on, you know, in the near future to help determine who would be the chief plant operator. So when is Coleman going to exit? So Coleman technically will always be like in the background, but it hopefully will be cut back to maybe around uh, five thousand a month. Uh, but uh, at the time being, until we have someone who's actually the chief plant operator. Uh, they will continue to do that function. We can talk about the budget side of that when we get to the yeah, budget. That's that's good. Good. Okay. Thank you. And then the last thing was, um, I'm just happy to hear that about the uh, city's application for managers to see. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We're uh, at this point, we are opening up. So, this is a good kind of a good uh, intro to the items from before. So, at this time, members of the public may comment on items not appearing on the agenda. Individual comments may be limited to three minutes or less. Please direct your comments to the council as a whole, maintain decorum, and avoid personal attacks on staff members or the council and other members of the public. Council and staff responses will be minimal for non-agenda items. So let me ask if there are any items from before. Any questions? Just very brief information. The coastal development permit to uh, complete the Memorial Lighthouse project down at the harbor owned by the Rancho Rio was uh, passed unanimously by the California Coastal Commission on February 10th. Update. Thank you. Let's update. And that actually did come up in our meeting with the ranchery yesterday. They said they were moving ahead and things were, were going well. So, are there uh, any items from the floor? Uh, anyone on Zoom that wants to raise hand or? Okay. Don't see anything. You guys keep me honest. If you see something, I don't. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's move on to the consent agenda. Uh, so these are there items that are considered routine to the city council. Any questions or comments on the is there a move to approve? First, we'll go to public comments. Are there any public comments on the consent agenda? No, there are none. I'll move to pass the agenda, consent agenda. I'll second that. All right. All those in favor? Okay. All right. All right, so the council passes the consent agenda unanimously, and we are going to move on then to the first item on tonight's agenda, which is uh, a presentation from the Tobacco Free North Coast, and this will be regarding the tobacco retail license policy. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Town of Trinidad, for having us tonight. 
Uh, we appreciate your time and we'll try to keep things brief. My name is Jay Sebri. I'm a project director with Tobacco Seed North Coast. We're a regionally funded project covering Del Norte, Humboldt Lake, and Mendocino counties funded by the California Department of Public Health. And our main goal is to assist uh, cities and counties in adopting policies that prevent uh, the toll, uh, prevent and reduce the toll that commercial tobacco takes on our people and our communities. Um, tonight's presentation, you have a lot of information in your packet. Uh, I know you probably haven't had a chance to look it all over yet, but please do take some time. Good bedtime reading. There's a lot of details in there, and tonight presentation will just highlight some of that information. Uh, in August of 2022, uh, the um, Humboldt County uh, Department of Public Health uh, provided a presentation to the Board of Supervisors about tobacco retail licensing. Tobacco retail licensing, or TRL, is recommended by both the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the California Department of Public Health as a public health best practice in reducing and preventing tobacco addiction. Um, the board at that time unanimously uh, voted to continue to proceed on looking at a TRL policy for County Unincorporated. And they asked that all of the other jurisdi jurisdictions of the county be brought along in that discussion. Um, that's a good thing for policy, for protecting the public health, but also creates a level playing field for emergence throughout the Humboldt County. So at that time, it was reported the illegal sales rate in Humboldt County was 54%, which is pretty darn high. Uh, similar results in some of the other cities that we surveyed back in March of 2022. So, um, uh, since that time, you may recall that uh, the state voters upheld a ban on the sale of flavored tobacco. We think that's a great thing. However, the state law provides no resources for local communities to enforce that law. It provides no additional funding for enforcement. So we want to see that happen, which the voters approved by <coughs> and argued. Uh, uh, we're going to have to make that happen ourselves. And TRL, back retail licensing, is a way to do that. Uh, so there's a lot of details in your packet. Uh, some folks here tonight to highlight some more of this information. Caitlin, Giddy, Caitlin Giddings is with the Humboldt County Department of Public Health. And uh, their program with the county is one of only three other counties in uh, California that are addressing the natural product waste one of the main forms of litter in our environment through changes in the retail environment. Tobacco retail licensing is one of those. Uh, then we have up here on Zoom, Amber Weir. Amber works for a project called NorCal for Health. They're really focused on long-term policies that, create, that build a healthier community, um, TRL being one of those. She was in instrumental in the, the TRL policy recently adopted by the Del Norte County Board of Supervisors. Um, so this is happening all over the state. Um, Jay Macedo originally worked in uh, Sonoma County, and Jay uh, helped Sonoma County and other jurisdictions down there help them implement the TRL policy that they have. So he's got on the ground experience. He's also a consultant with several of the tribal tobacco prevention programs. So at that, I'll pass it on to Caitlin, and thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm Caitlin Giddings. I'm the project director for Tobacco Free Humboldt with Humboldt County Public Health. And today, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the environmental aspect of all of this. So tobacco waste from cigarette butts, bake pens, and the packaging trash that all of those come in, it impacts both the public's health and the environment negatively. Cigarette butts are actually the number one most littered item on California's beaches and in its waterways. I heard you guys talk about stormwater earlier. It's also the number one thing that the North Coast Stormwater Coalition talks to me about when I attend According to the Humboldt County Visitors Bureau, 
Clean air and beaches are some of the top reasons that tourists are visiting cities like Trinidad and Florida. We found 233 cigarette butts um, on February 15th when we visited here uh, to do just a local pickup just in Trinidad city limits. Um, and so that's, you know, kind of impactful for us, especially in the off season. Um, on the bottom here, you'll see some of the cigarette filters, which I'll touch on. So these products, the, the butts, the vape pens, the trash from the packaging, these all leach not only nicotine, but also flavoring chemicals into the surrounding soil and the waterways, which is something we do not want. Uh, nicotine is actually classified as an acute hazardous waste by the EPA, which is kind of scary to hear for me at least. As cigarette butts degrade, the filters disintegrate, but they do not disappear completely. They actually turn into little particles of plastic called microplastics, and those are less than five millimeters long. I picked out a few of them from our lovely pickup. Um, you may have seen some of these just kind of, you know, on the street near storm drains, um, and they, they start to kind of blend in because they just get tramped down and then they're disintegrating into storm drain seepage. Um, so for the first time in 2022, microplastics were actually found in human blood, human organs, and human waste, meaning that we're ingesting these at kind of a high rate at this point. These can lead to chronic illnesses and cancer-causing conditions, not only for humans, but for wildlife. So that's another reason that this is really important. To improve the environment and community health, a proven best practice is to reduce the availability of tobacco products. The option to pass a local tobacco retail license so that Trinidad could more easily enforce the recently passed law prohibiting the sale of most flavored tobacco products in California could have a myriad of positive effects, including decreasing the amount of cigarette butts that we have washing into Trinidad storm drains and the ocean. Local efforts are needed to protect our environment and community health from commercial tobacco product waste. By reducing the number of tobacco products sold and available, tobacco use and trash will decrease. Next, we'll have Amber speaking on Zoom. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. That was very informative. Um, first off, uh, my name is Amber Weir. I'm project director for NorCal for Health. And I'm um, here, as Jay mentioned, uh, I'm up in uh, Del Norte County, actually. Uh, the weather was a little iffy on driving down tonight, so I apologize. Normally, I like to be there in person. Um, so hopefully tonight you'll be able to hear me and I'll stay connected. <laughs> I've already gotten popped off once, but we'll, we'll see. Um, my uh, my work has really been around the youth and how the tobacco companies uh, market to the youth. So thank you for sharing my uh, my slide there or my flyer. So what what we're really trying to address is the youth impacts. Uh, we have an epidemic of youth uh, vaping um, and becoming addicted to nicotine. And historically, tobacco companies. Uh, all know, you know, this is well researched and uh, and used as the way that they do their marketing. They know that most smokers today started uh, as a youth, so that they target our our youth in our communities, and they know that uh, exposure to marketing more than doubles the odds that kids will use tobacco, and youth are more likely to actually be influenced by ads than by peer pressure. So. So uh, youth are three times more sensitive to tobacco ads than adults. I think as we grow up, we kind of get blind to the, to the tobacco being everywhere. I have a short story uh, about a youth. This is before I started working in tobacco prevention. Uh, I was in a pharmacy and I had a youth with me and he started huffing and puffing in line. And I said, Colton, what's wrong? And he's like, I'm just, I don't, I don't get it. Back there, it, we were at a pharmacy. I just picked up my daughter's medicine. They want to save us. And up here, they want to kill us. Like, I don't understand which way. And I had no clue what he was talking about. And I looked forward and I was like, oh my gosh, you're right. There were cigarettes 
everywhere on the back wall. There were candies, bubble gum, and magazines all right there, right next to the cigarettes. And it was all eye level for him. And he's looking at his surroundings and learning from what is around him more than what people are telling him to do. I think we have some experience in that in our own lives. We, we learn from our environments and what people are doing more than what people are saying. If that were the case about singing, maybe we wouldn't be drinking so much sugar and playing on our cell phones all the time because that's what parents are telling the kids that it's bad for. So they really look at their <laughs> environments, uh, looking at tobacco. So what communities are doing to combat that is adding plugins in tobacco retail licenses that reduce that exposure. And you can do that, um, simple plugins. I know you don't have a pharmacy here, but in future you may. So requiring that pharmacies don't, if you have a pharmacy that you don't sell tobacco can be a plugin. Um, there's plugins on proximity to youth friendly places, like not having ads and tobacco retailers within a thousand feet of some of these youth-friendly playgrounds, daycares, uh, schools. Um, and then there's caps on how many retailers per population do you need? And, and what they like to do is, is have um, you know, one retailer per 2,500 people is kind of the, the, the area we, we like to be in on that. And I think, I think you might have two and, and um, I'm, that might be a little too many, <laughs> but what in, but what they do is put a restriction on not allowing more to come in so that it doesn't keep that influence happening. And then with those retailers that are there and selling tobacco, uh, you can put a policy in place that doesn't allow it to be sold on the countertops or near candy, chips and soda where kids are, or right by the door where people are coming and going and seeing it all. Uh, there's some storefront advertising that has been uh, really adopted by a lot of communities as far as only allowing 10% of the windows to be covered. And this is actually backed up as well by safety uh, and the crime-free kind of policies so that when police are doing their routes, they can see in and you can see out and it's safer for people in those convenience stores. So those are just some of the plugins that uh, jurisdictions are considering when adopting a tobacco retail license yeah. that I want to share with you tonight. And next we'll have Jay Macedo, who will talk about merchant education and the enforcement of a tobacco retail license. Uh, many California jurisdictions have passed and implemented these robust local TRLs. Uh, research has shown that TRL policies have an average annual reduction in used tobacco sales of 26%, with many communities seeing 50 to 90% reductions. Local TRL fees are set high enough to support and sustain local administration and enforcement. The average TRL fee in California was $344 per year, with $475 being the most common fee. Model TRL policy, and, and um, Amber mentioned some of the different kinds of policy options that are in there. Um, the, those provide many different options for each community to determine the best enforcement uh, protocols uh, for their community. As state-funded technical assistance providers or TA providers, our three agencies here tonight can provide um, uh, assistance with TRL policies, drafting, uh, fee setting, as well as procedures. Uh, many of these based on best practices of other California communities that have implemented them. We offer free compliance support to localities by educating retailers and the community about the TRL and also about the, the new statewide flavor ban that was mentioned this evening. Our agencies can develop and purchase store TRL signs, educational materials, and provide merchant trainings, perform store visits and surveys, and assist with implementation such as license protocols, um, applications, and compliance checks as well. We can work with local, local law enforcement to conduct those local purchase um, tobacco surveys. Jay had mentioned the rate was 54% here, Humboldt County Unincorporated. 
Um, so we could help um, run, help with running those. We could also um, assist with recruiting young adults uh, for deploy operations. And both of those types of, of strategies are to help us to evaluate the TRL policy goal, which is to reduce illegal tobacco sales to those that are under 21. Standardized local TRL policies across Humboldt County can help ensure regular education, compliance, and enforcement with local, state, and federal laws. These laws are designed to protect uh, those under 21 from tobacco and also create a level playing field for the retailers in Humboldt County across all jurisdictions. We respectfully invite council to direct staff to work with our projects and develop this policy for further consideration by the council and more details on the TAs available in those, those nice packets that you have and our contact information is in there as well. Uh, we look forward to, to meeting with um, staff and, and with council for TA, TA consultation around uh, tobacco policy. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. That was a really good presentation and you're doing wonderful work and we appreciate you uh, picking up our, our litter. I'm embarrassed that we have so many cigarette butts, but <laughs> we're, I'll be keeping an eye on those now. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, before I open the questions, I, I stopped by Murphy's and Chevron because I got curious. Murphy's only sell cigarettes. They don't sell vape pens at all or vape supplies in case uh, folks didn't know. The cigarettes are kind of by the front door, but they're, they're a bit off to the side. The Chevron sells, uh, probably sells two kinds of vapes that they pointed out to me, uh, but they don't sell any flavor. Um, they said that's by state law, so I was glad to hear that they're adhering to that. Um, I didn't see a real obvious display of cigarettes, but the vapes were right kind of by the, the checkout stand. So that might be something we could talk to them about. But anyway, I just wanted to update everybody. And those are, I believe, are only two retail outlets, yeah. Um, so let me open it to uh, any questions, counselors, or comments. Because now I know why they were kind of annoyed when I came in and asked the same question. <laughs> 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 Say, tell me, tomorrow, if that's what they say. People just go in and ask these companies if they are people who are concerned about this can go in and talk to them store owners and, and look at the cigarettes. I think that would be a little shocking if people are regularly coming into these stores and concerned about the cigarettes. So that might be something that could be helpful. But thank you, it was a great presentation. You mind if I ask about enforcement? Um, uh, you know, it's one of our uh, greatest challenges in a small city um, is enforcement of any code. Um, can you share, you know, if there's, if there are any similar communities, small communities with limited resources, can you share any kind of success stories with enforcement of a, of a TRL? Anyone? Yeah, I mean, and we do ask you to go to the bank. <laughs> just so that people can hear in Zoomlandia and whatnot. Yeah. That's good. Yes, Perry. Um, so uh, for Sonoma County, there are some smaller um, jurisdictions, like smaller cities within um, the Sonoma County area. And I know, um, at least for um, Sebastopol, I mean, they have 13 retailers, well, now 12, because actually their retailers went down once they enacted the TRL. Um, but for, the, for them, um, it enabled them to go by the stores more often because they were collecting a fee from each of the retailers, right? That then funded them. And so they were able to go in there, but it served for, to, to um, not just go in there for tobacco checks, right? They were going in for the alcohol, the, you know, the 21 is the name, you know, that's the H for everyone you know, for alcohol and tobacco. So it enabled them to go buy more of their stores more often, and they, that, they felt like that was definitely a benefit. So it was, but it helped to fund that piece of it. So it's 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 a self kind of funding mm -hmm. um, policy. It's not just another thing that's tapped onto what they're doing. Sure. However, we, what we did also is met with law enforcement and made sure that they were on the same page and that they, this was something that they wanted. And they felt like it aligned with their community uh, police, you know, the community, uh, Policing and things like that it, it, with their cop program, it like worked well with that. So that was a good thing for that. So I guess those were like that's a success in terms of their yeah. being able to go in them more often and, and develop more relationships with retailers. And then as our the agencies that we work with, the ones that are down there that are near us, we're able to go and look at education, just like you, you know, um, mentioned as well. So West is that they we went in and did education with them around the TRL policy and talked to them about it, and they started voluntarily doing. 
more like making stricter kind of policies for themselves and were taking things off the shelf, making it not high level. They weren't even in the actual city's policy. But it was kind of, it was, it was good. I think it was a good, it was a better relationship and integrating retailers and the community and law enforcement more, you know, for youth help. So maybe, but I felt like that was a success. Thank you. Any questions? All right, let me open to public comments or questions for the team. Don't see any questions, so you've done a very thorough job. Thank you so much. This is very interesting. The council will continue to, uh, you know, kind of mull this over and also talk middle of our Thank you. Yeah, feel free to reach to reach out to us with whatever you would be suggesting. We can run it through the process here. Thank you. Um, all right, our next uh, agenda item is a discussion decision regarding the 2022 State Transportation Improvement Program, uh, which is uh, a Trinity Street pavement rehab project. So, uh, Eli, I think you're going to cover that for us today. Right. Right? Yeah. Uh, so, this was provided by Josh Wolf from GHD. And uh, so, we're able to receive $272,000 from the STIP funding. Uh, which will recap the payment on Trinity Street. And uh, it is proposed for um, the construction would actually be happening, I believe, next year, since they do say uh, 2023 to 2024. And uh, as far as I can tell, it was uh, repaving Trinity Street. And, uh, and then attached to that is the contract uh, pr proposal for the engineering services for the rehab project with the uh, GHD to do the work. And uh, the very last, let's see, towards the end of it, it actually shows construction and engineering uh, will be happening next year in 2024. Uh, this year we'll have the uh, environmental document prepared, and then also have the plan specifications and estimates. Uh, so the environmental document should be done by July 1st, and the uh, plan specifications and estimates by the end of December with construction and engineering and the bid process and everything all happening in 2023. And then the very last page shows the uh, cost breakdown for GHD services uh, to prepare the plans, et cetera. So I, I can entertain any questions or comments that the uh, council and the public have. Any questions? I assume that in December, we would get some sort of, uh, you know, design coming back to council. Exactly. So yes. that if we approve this tonight, there's other opportunities for folks to weigh in and right. say, hey, this is what we want to do with Trinity Street. So, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then also uh, uh, next month at our March meeting, Josh Wolf, the traffic engineer from GHD, uh, will be present for that other item that we moved. Mm -hmm. And then we can also ask him, uh, you know, a little sure. bit more definitive on this, but but yes, it will be coming back okay. uh, with the plans for the council to approve. Do you happen to know how, how long ago it was on this page before? It seems like it's in pretty good shape, but yeah, does anyone know? I'm well, trying to game this has been here more. I think when we did the stormwater the project storm. and dug oh, up yeah. the whole street, that was I don't know if the entire street was paved, but at least half. Good I point. That's actually from the uh, the parallel in front of your place yeah. this way. Yeah. This way. No, I think it was beyond our house. It came a little farther. Yeah. It's been a long time. Yeah. It's been a little, it's, 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 if you go on, walk up and up, it's in pretty bad shape. Right? Yeah. So there's a lot of work. I'm complaining about it because I'm just surprised how fast it's deteriorating. So I'm hoping this will not only bring it back to a standard, but also help it stay that way because I think we've lost a lot of the street over the last. There's just too many big trucks coming up and down the street. So. I think it's a great idea. I'm glad it's good. So we need it. So we need it. Is, um, the money has to all be earmarked for Trinity. We can't use it for any other street repair. Yeah, that's correct. Right. 
And I'll ask this of Josh next month about, yeah. about is there a way to, all right, if we know trucks are going to be coming up and down the street, is there some way they can engineer it to be a little more resilient? Good idea. I'll, I'll try to remember to ask that next week or next well, that's, that's one of the good things about our city is between Main Street, Trinity, and Edwards, you know, we've got three streets that basically carry the bulk of the traffic. Right. That's true. What's the name of the ocean? Oh, yeah, a great number. <laughs> good. Yeah. yeah, you're a runner up. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was thinking of the Parker Creek Road. You know, that was. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> talking about that stuff. Yeah, that's a real point. Yeah, and one we do is project too. Would be I used to kind of look at trying to you know get more traffic to come down Trinity Street and avoid Ocean and View. I mean, we've talked about this for years of trying to direct traffic. Mm -hmm. Maybe that would be something we'll be trying to do is to try to get that traffic. Yeah, to travel that's a great Ocean. thing to bring up with so Josh. Josh. It's, it, it's it's been mentioned before. So it would be great to tie it in into a formal uh, program. Yeah. Uh, we'll get into the public comments. Are there any public comments about the uh, step program? I, I see no public comments. So we, uh, I think that's a wrap. And then we'll look forward to uh, hearing from uh, Josh in our next meeting. And we'll talk about the traffic calming uh, agenda item at that time. I think we need to yeah, yeah well vote on, on the contract. Yeah, we need to I would move that we authorize the city manager to execute the task order with GHD to complete the environmental engineering construction and service for 22 stip Trinity rehab project. Thank you. I'll second second. second. And Jack seconded, so all those in favor? Aye. 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 Sir. Aye. All right, uh, next up is a discussion decision regarding the temporary closure of the Ashland Memorial Trail and the Parker Creek uh, Trail beach access to Old Home Beach. And Eli, I think you had a, we're gonna open up this topic for us. Yeah. Yes, so I will open with this. I did make the following comment in the agenda packet. Uh, so the Axel Lindgren Memorial Trail and the Parker Creek Trail, uh, and the Parker Creek Trail is just the beach access portion, uh, are currently closed. Uh, otherwise, the Parker Creek Trail and the old wagon trail, you people can still walk that way uh, without uh, be being closed. And uh, this is a temporary emergency closure uh, due to bluff erosion as well as Degree from recent storms that battered the coast. Uh, a C CDP is required within 30 days of closure, which will be the, towards uh, somewhere around between the 10th and 12th of uh, March. The uh, city engineer and city planner are working with staff as well as the California Coastal Commission, Coastal Conservancy, the Chirai Ancestral Society, the Yurok Tribe. We discussed this at the Chirai. Uh, management team meetings where these different uh, parties were present. Uh, so several meetings have taken place. We had another meeting uh, on Monday and we have a meeting coming up on the 13th. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I've also uh, spoke today to Steve Allen again, our city engineer. And I also spoke to Giovanni who works with SHM and was the engineer actually a geologist. He was the geologist who prepared a 2004 report regarding the uh, beach area. And uh, Giovanni is supposed to be coming next week. And when he does come, Steve Allen will join and I will we'll go down to the uh, beach and we'll walk in that area and find out uh, some suggestions from both the engineer and the geologist on what short-term measures can be done so that we can reopen the trails as quick as possible. Uh, so, so that's that's the goal. Uh, we we want to make sure that it number one that it's safe uh, and number two that we have a good way to uh, help address some of the erosion that's happening in that area uh, with the from the recent storms uh, where the high tide has uh, Better the uh, 
the coast there. So I will entertain any questions or questions. Eli? I have one. Uh, I see people going down anyhow, even though it gets taped off. Is the city liable in any way? No. Uh, the uh, our insurance company, we, we did that with uh, specifically the Van Wick Trail, and uh, they had requested that we, for Van Wick, that we just put close signs, and, and we do have a chain across on both sides of Van Wick. So here in this case, we say closed, and we've got uh, three uh, of the barricades uh, connect, you know, right, right by each other, just saying that it's closed. So at that point, the insurance company is comfortable that uh, you know we don't have that liability, uh, or if we do, it's minimized. Otherwise, uh, we have had signage before for the Axel Lindgren Trail, which indicated that uh, it was in poor condition and uh, basically to, to do it at your own risk. So because we closed it, we removed that sign for the time being. But the, the prior sign was uh, word, worded exactly how the insurance company had suggested that it be worded. So, so we're trying to follow as much as possible, uh, you know, the uh, proper protocol for safety and liability. Other questions for Eli? No, excellent. What, do we have, uh, are you pretty sure we will have all the trails open by some? That's the goal. And, and I can, I personally, again, I'm just saying this first, I can see no reason that they would be closed that long. And, and hopefully, uh, you know, within a couple of months for sure. So as soon as we can, we will have them open. Uh, we just want to make sure that uh, that area where there is the erosion is uh, properly addressed by both the geologist and the engineer. Did you have something nope. to add? Um, I guess I'll just comment that I um, was strongly supportive of closing the trails um, because we were working with so many different groups that were uh, supportive of that as well, including Taz, the Yurok Pride. California Coastal Conservancy, et cetera. Um, I do think that the Parker Creek, again, my personal opinion is that we, we closed on February 10th. It was a 30 day emergency CDP. And my personal opinion is that we should open the Parker Creek Trail at that 30 day window if we can, leaving potentially the Axel Lingrid Trail closed because it is in the worst shape. Um, it would be nice to be able to do the work. Uh, as quickly as possible to shore up um, uh, any natural, uh, you know, uh, issues that we have down there. Um, so, you know, whatever we can do to shore it up using uh, maybe debris that we have that we can work with rocks or logs or what have you would be great. But anyway, that's that's my thought is that we're going to have to open up one of the trails because we're getting into spring and summer. But, but we'll see how it goes. And you'll report back uh, after walking the beach with Steve and, and Giovanni then to <clears throat> to get their recommendations about how is this a you know something that a right. a, a public sort of you know volunteer crew could get some work done or is it is it going to require you know much greater so that that would be my question regarding the you know, what to do after thirty days is to have a better sense of is this something that we can you know, mitigate until next year's storms okay. um, with some more some more heavy duty work, or is this something that really is is got to be a more of an engineered approach? Right. So all I would ask is that what month are we? February at our March meeting that we would get an yeah. update. You know, yeah, to know what's going on. Yeah, yeah. The, the plan is is to uh, meet with both of them before our Good. March meeting. Good. Uh, in addition to that, uh, some of the conversations that we had were dealing with what would be considered, number one, a short-term fix in order to get the trails open quickly. Uh, number two, uh, what they are calling a medium fix, which they're foreseeing possibly for up to 20 years. And then a long-term fix, which hopefully will go much longer than that. Uh, I see that the long-term fix would be probably coinciding with our coastal resilience plan uh, and, and then I see the other two, the short-term and the midterm, 
uh, being addressed by the engineers and geologists in, in you know, in uh, uh, as quick as possible, at least for the short term, because uh, uh, beach access is really important for our community. Uh, personally, I just feel like, uh, uh, you know, that uh, right now, because it is not the heavy visitor season, it's really just our residents. Uh, but again, we want to make sure that people are safe. We don't want them to go down there and, and not be safe. Uh, so I, I think as soon as we can get that short-term portion done, uh, I, I would like to see the trails open. Yeah, yeah that's great. I mean, it's one of the places where we have competing priorities, right? We, On the one hand, we want preservation and protection. And, and on the other hand, we want public access. And those are both huge priorities for the city. So, um, so I think we're all... Um, very excited to move forward. So, and I would ask that we that we reach out to the land trust, the Trinidad Coastal Land Trust. They have um, annual efforts to restore their their access points, um, and it's always the last twenty steps that they're working, right? And so, um, I, I believe that we have the expertise in the area to to do something a little different than what we're doing. Um, and I would encourage us; these trails would be a great place to kind of get get our feet under us in that in in that respect let's do something different than just hope it gets better mm. right so that, sure. that would be my encouragement to also bring in i see a lot of these folks on on your your right up here and i i would add that or ask that we add the the land trust just because yeah they've got six or seven access spots on, on the coast that they're trying to maintain mm -hmm. and they you know they employ a quite a uh large group of volunteers, but they do get it done without, you know, tractors and cranes. I mean, they're doing it with, with, you know, what they can carry. So um, anyway, I just think there's a, a solution out there for us. Good. Good suggestion. All right, let me open up to public comment and I'll also uh, mention that there were a few emails from the city that are in the packets or if they're not in the packets, they're online for the council. Um, and so please take one of those. Any public comments in Zoom land or in the room? Right? If we want to um, look at any of those public comments that came in, let me just see. I think, I think it might have just been one, so let me have a quick look here. In the meantime, I did want to mention that uh, at uh, the Coastal Commission at our last meeting was talking about the Table Bluff Reservation, Leot Tribe, and uh, they were talking about how that was addressed, which was done uh, between 2003 and 2004. So that's uh, in Humboldt Bay, where Indian Island is. And they used a process there, uh, which they were referring to and let me get the proper verdict here. So just give me one moment. Uh, so they placed 391 cubic yards of revetment, R-E-V-E-T-M-E-N-T, -E -E and I looked it up, it's just <laughs> materials, along a 400 foot long segment of the bay shoreline of Indian Island to stabilize and protect the mound place from further shoreline erosion and help prevent the remaining artifacts, cultural resources, and just the uh, erosion that was happening along that shoreline. So basically, the revetment materials is a way to help address shorelines and erosion with the shorelines. Oh, interesting. I was not familiar with the revetments either, so thank you. Um, so we do have the uh, public comment on the uh, screen, and I won't read the whole uh, note, but in essence, it's uh, opposed to closure of the trails, um, and so this uh, individual is asking us to open as soon as possible. So uh, we will read that public comment of the counselors will and, and take it under advisement. So thank you. Um, with that, I'm gonna move on to our next agenda item, which is the discussion and presentation about the mid-year uh, budget. And so for that, I am turning it over to Eli. Okay. Yeah, I'll just start off real briefly. Uh, Gabe is our guru, and uh, I'm really fortunate on a staff level to have someone who not only knows what he's doing regarding this, but he's been doing it for quite a while, um, or at least quite a while since I've been. So, uh, 
So basically, we've got the uh, budget, which will be coming up uh, that we would need to approve for the following year. But based upon last year's budget, we like to do a mid year budget review. And in order to do the proper mid year budget review, you have to wait until you get all the data from the first two quarters of the fiscal year, which would be from July 1st uh, until December 31st. So we finally got the December materials, the financials, which are included in the packet, and then also under this uh, discussion item. So I'll just turn it over to Gabe and, and let him take it from here. Thank you. Okay, so. I'm just going to pull a Dick Bruce here and read a little bit from the pre <laughs> prepared uh, document that I wrote up just to keep me on target because I <laughs> this is a this is an assignment that I can I, I kind of geek out on sometimes and I really dive into the numbers and I could be talking all night but I, I don't want to do that it's cold and <laughs> I get moving so um, thank you. yeah so but I you know, so I just want to make. Um, you know, make a couple of points here. Uh, I do look over the financial statements periodically, and I, I, I am pretty aware of what's going on with with our financial situation. And if I wasn't, I would bring it to your attention. I think that's your job as council members, which is kind of how I start off here. Is that public entities operate on the fiscal year cycle beginning July first and ending June thirtieth. And let me pause for a second. I'm going to kind of just. Uh, gear down for a second because Katie's with us and she may have not had the benefit of learning, you know, some of these, um, you know, kind of understanding how the city's budget works. So I kind of took a minute to had a couple of notes here about, about how the system works, right? So we have a, we have a, the city has an, has a obligation to um, adopt a budget, uh, plan, a spending plan by on or before July 1st of every year. Uh, and periodically through the year, it's fiscally responsible for governing boards to do a pulse check on revenues and expenses and ensure that their plans are on track. Um, it makes sense to do this mid-year for us, obviously now. Last year, we didn't because we had so many moving targets. So we just kind of plowed through the year. And then at the end of the year, we kind of poked our heads out of the dirt and we're like, how did we do, you know? Uh, and, and we actually did pretty well, but we, we lost a lot of employees. Uh, we had a lot of what's called adversity, and um, we weren't able to spend money. So at the end of, and we had a couple of odd revenue sources. So we ended up coming out ahead, but we didn't achieve a lot of the things that we wanted to do either. So um, anyway, the tools that we use to develop the framework for our, our budget structure are the following. And I listed here on the website, which might be kind of hard to read, but if you have your packets open, it's number one, it's our annual budget, which we adopt on or before July of every year. Uh, budget summaries and narratives included in the meeting packets during the budget preparation. Those are the, the things that I actually write up to make sense of these numbers. And I oftentimes kind of harken back to them throughout the year when we do these budget discussions because I'm looking back at what I kind of forecasted for the year, what we were anticipating, and then now six months later or even nine months later, we can look back and say, hey, were we on the right track? So those narratives I try to keep close with me throughout this process, and you'll probably see them again here in the next couple of months when we break open the, the 2024 budget year, um, discussion. So the detailed financial reports, which are provided by the bookkeeper, those are those, you know, 14 pages following this agenda topic here in the packet um, that look like a bunch of numbers showing you your, they're basically your profit and loss uh, statements for each one of the city's budget categories. Uh, and then the last two things are the general ledger. That is a very huge and extended Excel spreadsheet detailing every single expenditure. So when, when we see something odd in those budget uh, profit and loss sheets, let's call them, uh, somebody says, why is this so huge and why are we out of whack there? I can actually go to the general ledger and find exactly what was allocated to that budget line item and I can tell you what it was for. So I can explain some of these anomalies. 
Uh, and then finally, the annual audit, which is what our uh, auditor, Ralph Marcel, has been doing every year. He basically checks all of our work at the end of every year. He checks for loss potential. He checks for, you know, uh, honesty. He checks to make sure that our books are in order as per the state guidelines. So we have a lot of different ways and different tools that we use to manage the city's budget. Um, so included in this attachment, uh, is everything but the general ledger, or in the packet, is everything but the general ledger and the annual audit, obviously. The audit we're going to be talking about next month, hopefully in summary, we'll be able to just put it up on, as a, maybe as a consent item, unless Ralph can be here. But I'm going to cover just a couple of things in, that are covered in this audit tonight and give, you, give everyone a chance to, to ask questions. So a quick overview. The budget consists of of individual budgets within the following structure. So you got the general fund and the general fund makes, it, it has four primary categories, the administrative category, the public works category, uh, police and fire. And uh, those general fund expenditures come from our revenues, such as uh, sales tax, occupancy tax, and different unrestricted funding sources. So in those four funds, this council has the authority to spend money on whatever it chooses to spend on things that are not restricted. And restricted funds are the water and the cemetery, primarily. We also have special revenues that are kind of also called restricted funds, um, but we call them special revenues, and those are gas taxes and transportation funds. COPS funding, which is a grant that we receive money from every year, and those monies cannot be used to, you know, buy you a new desk. Uh, they have to be specifically used for specific sources. So grants then is the fourth category, and those grants are, are vital, as we all know in this room, our vital uh, source of revenue in the city that helps fund our critical big picture infrastructure uh, and long range plan. So, so that's, that's the, the framework for our city budget. So I talked about the types of revenues that cover the general fund, restricted revenues, um, and I and I made a note here in this report that the staff report from the June 28, 22 meeting was a benchmark for us indicating the city's thought process in the financial reporting and forecasting to develop our spending plan for 2022-2023. And some of those highlights I just picked apart from the report, which are also in the packet. Uh, I just have three of them here. So number one was due to our staffing issues experienced in the prior year. It was understood that this year would be uh, a year to prioritize recruiting and training new staff, which is what we're doing uh, for the most part. The water department, we're kind of trying, but the rest, yeah, John, Jennifer, uh, even John Bickley, who we were uh, with Public Works. Most of you know his face and seen him around now. That's these. This is what we said we were going to invest in, and this is what we're doing. Um, monitoring under anticipated revenue sources and economic trends to determine whether dipping into the reserves would be necessary as dipping into the general fund reserve at the 25K is possible. We, we did that, um, but not that much. You know, our under anticipated revenue sources have actually proven to be better and healthier than what we ex what I expect. I, was, I always budget conservatively for the city's revenue. So when you read our budget reports, you're gonna see revenues that are conservative. You're gonna see expenditures um, that I'm, uh, that I'm kind of liberal. So that, you know, kind of, kind of in a weird way, at the end of the year, we generally end up okay because we're, I'm, I'm not expecting money to come in that may not come in. All of our revenue sources are volatile. Sales taxes and occupancy taxes are two biggest ones, and they could change at any time. Uh, property taxes are state. So I can budget property taxes perfectly, but I can't necessarily budget sales and occupancy taxes uh, accurately because as we learned from COVID, we shut down for a quarter and all of a sudden your revenue stream dried up. So um, uh, the third thing was anticipating a year-end spending deficit in the water fund of at least 200K, and another 160 or more for 2023 if the staffing solution isn't implemented, permanent staffing. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. We're seeing that happen and unfolding right before our eyes. Uh, and it's, it's, it's not getting any better. Uh, and, and we budgeted for this. We saw this coming. So um, what else is there here? So... 
there is a, a page in here that I'm going to touch on uh, for a second in a, in a minute, uh, which which we call Ralph called it the uh, unaudited supplementary supplementary budget information, and uh, it's kind of a long word basically for saying, uh, hey, I'm going to show you. He did this. He's going to show us in a real quick chart, which is in the packet, what we budgeted and where we ended up in about six categories. And it's awesome. That's good. Uh, and and I'll, I'll point that to you here on the, on the screen here in a second. Uh, it, but it appears that sales tax revenue once again exceeded expectations. Property tax, this is for the audit that we just uh, finished. Uh, the property taxes and occupancy taxes did, did also did very well. Um, uncollected fees for planning and building services from previous years were recovered in 2022. Uh, but interest income was down significantly this last year. The economy, the, the stock markets didn't do so well. And typically, I think the city puts well over $25,000 or more in its pocket every year just from the interest invested in late and other funds. Um, I think this last year, it was barely six. Okay. It was a pretty big one. Um, and just as a footnote to that, we also had a stormwater project. So we had to draw money out of late to have that ready to pay the cash, cash, flow. The cash flow before we could actually uh, go ahead and put money back in towards the end of the year. That's true. Good point. Oh, so that's that's the another loss of our interest, interest is yeah. that money was pulled out. So, um, and we're probably going to see that again with this big uh, water infrastructure. With the, 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 yeah. What you call it, the tank replacement. Yeah. So, uh, regarding okay. expenditures overall, the city underspent in all but the general fund expense categories, uh, except for the administrative categories. And that was primarily due to higher than average legal services. We had a lot going on in this last prior year, legal service wise. Um, but we uh, anticipated a conservative revenue expectations and underspent, underspending did that production. So, it all kind of balanced out in the wash. So, Staffing, um, I, I put a staff organizational chart in the packet because there's been some questions about, you know, who's doing what around here and what's with our, our water department and, you know, who's who's full-time, who's part-time, uh, what are we doing? And this just kind of opens the door, I think, for that conversation tonight, whether you want to get into it, I don't know. But uh, I, I just kind of put some notes in here about our staffing and our full-time equivalent staff. Uh, we still uh, are employing approximately eight people uh, based on the combination of full and part-time staff. Uh, so we, 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 you know, one person would, if it's a part-time person, it's 0.5 FTD, so full-time equivalent. So half-time equivalent person. Um, and, and even though there might be 10 people working here, we're really only employing about eight full-time. Um, or I'm sorry, eight people total, five full-time actually. We're still waiting to hire our full-time grant administrator coming on board this uh, next month, mm -hmm. Angela Zetter. Mm -hmm. And we're still trying to kind of swim our way through the water, you know, staff, uh, which which are projects that we're working on. Um, let's see. Financial and, and nine is what well, just nine yeah. FTE is yeah. is we were at something like seven and and a half for the longest time, right? Barely. Six, yeah. six and a half to seven and a half, if I remember correctly. Yep. Okay. And we, we, uh, I just think it's important to say that. And yeah, this is a pet project of mine, I guess, is or just something I'm really grateful for is that with the nine full time equivalent employees, we don't have the backlog and we don't have the complaints that Trinidad takes so long to do everything. And it's really, I just want to say that it, it's its so easy to observe the benefit of having all these people working for the city. So I just want to say that. It's a great point because yeah. that was, that was um, the justification basically for, you know, hiring was just, um, you know, Anton sitting next to me here and, and Jennifer. And I'll touch on the septic program in a minute as a, as a quick, let's call it a highlight, low light. Um, but but those programs just kind of sat idle and collected dust. And those were priorities made by the council. But you know, you can you can we can sit here and create programs all day long, but you don't have people to do it. Yeah. And you predetermine that that's a priority of the city. The city has an obligation to follow. Yeah. So we've been able to do that. We put those wheels in motion from an administrative perspective. But you're right. You know, the city had typically operated on about six full-time people. 
in the past. So we've made some changes to that. And I guess they, uh, a lot of it has to do with regulatory environment of the world that we live in. Today. You know, there's so many regulations and there's so many mandates, some of them funded, and as we learned tonight, unfunded from the tobacco folks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that that uh, we're, we're pretty lucky. We're targeting a lot of the funded ones. And we've got creative grant people to go target those funds. Yeah. Those grant funds to help the city meet its funding man or its mandate. So, um, so anyway, the financial packets included in, in the the financial statements, including in this meeting packet, uh, cover all activity from July first through December thirty first. Uh, it's an easy scan of the primary funds: revenue, admin, public works, fire. This is just my eyes kind of reiterating to you what I'm seeing. Um, depict spending at or near 50% midway through the year. When we had, uh, you know, some, some of the guys that used to work for the city as council members, Jim Cufferson was one of them that I used to, uh, you know, argue with all the time about this, is he would go down and he would see anything more than 50% at six months. He's like, something's out of control. Something's out of that. And it doesn't always work. Like that. You know, some of our expenditures are one-time expenditures. So you might see a column in our staff, in our, uh, financial statements that say 100% or zero, you know, that means they spent it all already, but you kind of have to read between the lines to know what that expenditure was, you know, but for the most part, as I read through all of the statements, I mean, we were right at 50% on average for everything, and the bottom line depicts that in some cases, or let's say in most cases, there's some where it's a little bit over and under, such as our fire department, they, they just budget they expect the worst thing to happen, but they, you know, in terms of spending, they're really thrifty and they get things done. Um, two of my primary concerns when I looked at this budget, or when I looked at the financial statements, obviously, are the water fund and the septic program. And I, the septic program, you know, it's not a, a huge concern, and I'm not saying it's uh, there's any right way to fix it. It's nothing but good for the community in terms of, you know, the, the goals, you know, to make sure that people have functioning septic systems that are working and not creating public health hazard for their neighbors. So I think we have water. We all know about like the water challenges because we've talked about that a lot. We can talk about it some more, but can you elaborate a little bit on this subject? Like where's the, where's the yes. overflow coming? Excuse me. point. <laughs> so, yeah. We have the water, so the septic. So the septic is, is pretty much overspent uh, in our audit from last year, $11,000, which isn't bad. Um, but, you know, relative to the fees that come in. So the city has predetermined what the fee is for a septic permit for a resident. You know, if you have a standard system, it's 100 bucks. If you have a non standard system, it's 75 if you come back and do your renewals two years later, it's 75 flat. Um, so what's happening is that we're, we're figuring out now that we've kicked this program into high gear, Jennifer Hagen, who's listening, I think, out there in Zoom land, yep. uh, you know, she's done a really good job of hurting cats. I, I have seen Steve Septic Service patrolling town more than I've ever seen him. <laughs> and you can smell him too, he's pumping next year. Um, but he, uh, they, that program is, um, it's just, it's just lit up They're They're, you know, these inspection reports come into us on a regular basis, but not all of them are straightforward. When Steve septic service finds and writes a report that says, Hey, guess what? Your leach lines have failed. We have no idea. We, we can't fill out your report any further be, because your leach lines have failed. Yeah, I don't have it. Now all of a sudden. <laughs> You know, we, we're getting into a dialogue with residents and Trevor Parker, our staff planner, has to really kind of dig through with a fine tooth comb and we need to start documenting several conversations with the residents saying, God, we had no idea we had a failing system. Sorry, City of Trinidad. And then City of Trinidad says, well, have Steve Septic Service send us the quote for the work being done so we can keep our finger on the pulse. We don't lose track of this. Yeah. Next thing you know, we've got these you know, you know, two, three, four hours invested. Uh, and Trevor's been in the city for her time, categorized to OWTS. Jennifer's kind of building a fatter, fatter file on this one particular property. But the point is to collect the data. 
So do we want to like do a cost recovery system for septic systems like we do for planning? Um, those are bigger questions that I think the council and that Trevor Parker can city planner can kind of help to figure it out. Yeah. Top of Just do you see that changing as we get a better grip on the whole thing? Yes. You know, the, we always knew that the initial push coming out of the gates on this thing was going to be ugly. And that's why it took seven years to get it off the ground because it only one person working for the city 10 years to get it off. What, I mean, it, once they started this, it became this giant can of worms, you know? Really and important. when people hear that their septic system failed, they don't call us up happily. <laughs> you know, they're not, they're resistant. If anything, like, oh God, don't tell the city, you know. And then we're trying to get information, find out what's going on. For the for the most part, people have been very cooperative. And it's not cheap if you've got a failed system, right? I know that. It's not something people just say, Oh, how much is it? I'll write a check, let's fix it. They have to dig deep sometimes to no content. But to, to dig, <laughs> dig new lease lines or put a new tank in or something, and that's not cheap. So then now the city is saying, hey. Let's evaluate what they've got going on. Let's see how far we're willing to let them go. Let's put this all in writing. You know, the cash register is now chiming in because Trevor's writing this all up. And then six months later or three months later, or six weeks later, we're putting a lid on this um, project and writing somebody a permit for three to five years. So it's just a big project. And I'm kind of thinking this year, instead of 11,000, it might kind of creep up into the 10 or 15 or 15,000, maybe more, if we it's continue on this pitch. It's not that fast. Percentage wise, it's a little different over it's been, but in real dollars, it's just like much. And we're, um, we're expecting this to, to once we get on a regular inspection uh, routine, yeah. that we're not going to see these large project kind of approaches to. Wow, your system is you know is years out of compliance, and therefore it needs a lot of back and forth, right? We were expecting sort of the the, the front end loaded kind of expenses, but then it should calm down a little bit. So if we do a, a pricing discussion later on, I, I would just I, it sounds like we're not talking about well this is the new normal. Instead, this is you know this is sort of this concerted effort to point out how much work needs to be done, but in the future, it shouldn't be so significant, yeah, right? Probably right? Sure. Whatever that you know, like cost of doing business now. If you, yeah. want to, if you want to call it something like that, you can say, well, it's the cost of doing business. We want to protect the coast. We want to protect the water quality yeah. around here. We want to protect public health. You know, we've made a commitment to do that. Let's stick with it. You know, yeah. let's, let's have the city kind of absorb those costs. The only thing that makes it complicated is that the city went out of its way to create a a permit fee recovery structure. So now I guess we're we have to just kind of kind of we'll go another year and just kind of see where we land and and take it from there. But we're you know so we're basically taking a hundred dollars from somebody to do you know maybe what what is ended up being about what, three five hundred dollars of work. So um, <laughs> times two hundred whatever yeah. properties. That's actually pretty simple. Yeah, and wait, wait, wait until our projects are done before we jump the price up. Yeah, let's wait till your project is done. Thank you. So, so the water in the static. I was just wondering why my fee was five times as much as what was mentioned, but I was like, pay for jacks. It's like, it's basically a council tax. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so uh, those were my two big, uh, you know, when I looked at the statements, everything looks to me. In fact, we're even kind of under because we still have um, we still have a fully staffed or benefited, you know, full time employees over at the, the water treatment oh, plant. Yeah. But we're paying on the high end to consult. So, um, anyway, that's what I call kind of leaking. Um, so, anyway, uh, you know, this was the staff report that I had um, I highlighted a couple things in, in the June 28, 2022, kind of budget approval narrative. Um, and highlighted, you know, at June 30, 2023, uh, year in, we're projected to spend 160000 Now, that was with, I think we had uh, Coleman sort of uh, sunsetting, taking off, yeah, uh, mid year. 
So my guess is it's not, depending on where we are. So we had our goal set up for us, uh, utilize reserves established from prior fiscal years, which we did. Um, Can I ask about that real quick? Yeah. Um, will we, when, when's a good time to sort of pose the question, okay, we've been dipping into our reserves for the last couple of years. Do we need to, is that more of a, of a next year's budget discussion saying, hey, our reserves have taken quite a beating the last two years and propose some sort of way to bring them back up because we've, we've benefited from having those reserves, but kind of like the interest lost interest income, right? The, the, the less money you have in there, the less money you have to do work. Yeah, and the water rate study. So as soon as we get that in place, uh, that'll then, help us recover. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. And then, and then, like I have noted, uh, we're pursuing uh, uh, it's called RCAC, which uh, did, did it for free for the city of Crescent yeah. City. So we need to see if we qualify for that. But uh, that would be great to, if we could get the water rate study done at that price. I just want to put it on people's radar that, yeah. that our reserve has really been hit pretty significantly and we ought to work on ways to bring it back up to the levels that we agreed upon several years ago yes and and i think to focus that the water fund primarily yeah and here's one so what i what i mentioned i just kind of touched on it we call it the, the required supplementary supplemental supplementary information on audit this came from our auditor this year this is a separate document that he sent it's a great tool. I like this one a lot because it, it kind of tells you, you know, where you ended up this last year in the bank, mm -hmm. you know, relative to, it, it's just, it's just money. It's revenues. Primarily. So, so what you see, if you can read this, I just kind of want to point out, he made a nice chart. So for property tax here, if I go across this line right here, 113,525 is what we budgeted, but the county tax assessor has been going around targeting Trinidad uh, because I guess there's a lot of properties that went into like a prop something I forgot what it's called during the housing market crash years ago they went into like kind of a property tax freeze from their uh, assessed increases each year and then the county tax collector auditor's office or assessor's office has been going around the last two years reassessing Trinidad properties because I guess Trinidad has some nice properties that have good value that the county wasn't reaping from mm -hmm. because a lot of these properties were in like a tax increase freeze or an assessed value freeze yeah after 2008 Eight. Yeah. yeah yeah so anyway so here we were we landed this last year with 130,000. so this is a, a a positive variance from what we budgeted of 16.5 you go across the line this one got my attention we budgeted 280,000 in retail sales tax and this is where we land. Yeah, so that's a good one. So, you know, I, I didn't say I missed the mark, but I do budget conservatively when it comes to sales tax. And this was so big. And it was a, kind of an unintended consequence of kind of the COVID year, kind yeah. of, uh, of in the wake of COVID year, and people started shopping online. So, so instead of shopping at local, doing their shopping at local retailers, they were doing everything on Amazon and everywhere else. And when people do that, that increases the city sales tax rate. So there is another variance in a positive category uh, for the city. A uh, couple other occupancy taxes, we landed a little bit heavier. Um, let's see, the license fee, that's not so exciting. Building and planning fees, um, you're actually, this is a result of having extra employees that we can kind of go and really get these fee recovery mechanisms executed. Because a lot of times we didn't do that in the month, you know, residents were subsidizing, you know, someone else's uh, third story mm -hmm. uh, somewhere. And that's not how that system is supposed to work, you know, in the planning process, in the building fee process. Uh, so bottom line, this number right here is, uh, uh, Steve, this is kind of what we were talking about yeah. in reserves. This is what we actually, let's call it bank. Yeah. Right? So we bank that in, in the form of our, um, you know, replenished our reserves from any any, any underspending the year before. Good. Um, this was the first half of this year. This was the uh, finished. This was the finished 
prior fiscal year, June 3rd. I see. So June so 3rd, 2022. We budgeted, yeah, we budgeted 834,600 in expenditures, and that includes Anne, Jennifer, myself, part of Elon's salary, portion of all of our salaries, city attorney, city building inspector, plan, you know, uh, keeping the lights on, let's just say. And we ended up, um, we, we budgeted this much in revenue and we ended up with this much. So putting that in the city's reserves for a rainy year day. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Positive. Water fund, different story. Yeah. So if we're going to focus anywhere, we're going to focus on our water fund. And then that's going to come in the form of a rate study. And that's going to come in the form of what we what we believe is our ideal staffing solution, what we can operate on, we're going to have to kind of really focus our, our the ordinance on the water fund based on what we think we need and what we expect we need, not kind of this crazy, you know, place that we're in. So it sounds like you don't see any major kind of derailments, just some cautionary issues around water and ODBTS. And we knew the staffing costs were going to increase, but we're seeing a cost benefit relationship. OWTS, we're seeing you know some some additional expenditure, but it's it was to be expected that we'd have a blip at the beginning. So is there is there anything else that kind of jumped out at you when you looked at this day that was like yay or not yay? I mean, this was good news, by the way. So the banking of this additional money last fiscal was. Was very positive yeah, the last fiscal year and then the prior fiscal yeah and we expected yeah. this to happen because we didn't have the we were just getting administrative staff on board and and they were here for like seven months I think uh once the fiscal year last year June 30 hit was that your seven months yeah. October so they were still getting their feet wet um and we had not expended money because we didn't have the people to do so. This year, we're kind of moving into that territory from a public works perspective, certainly not our water fund. But um, I don't, I didn't see anything else that really jumped out. That's yeah. a really good question. And I, and I think that the city is, is in a healthy place. And I'd also like to maybe open this budget year up when we do our budget season discussions, not to say that we're in a place where we should be you know, being really um, too liberal with our spending. But I think it would be a great opportunity to explore with the public if there are, or even as council members, you know, things like, let's just say the underground utility project. Let's just see if there's a way we can start investing these, um, these, uh, these savings kind of amortized over time. Of course, we're not expecting to just take that money and drop it on underwood. But, um, you know, things like that, projects that we haven't had a chance to really fully formulate because we don't know, we haven't been able to see kind of where we're going to land. But now that we do know, um, we have a little better output and forecast. I think we can entertain some of these projects that are kind of reinvestments in the community. I think the city's looking pretty good. Uh, I'd love to see more money spent on trails, you know, improvements. And I think that money's earmarked for that. I'd love to see that happen, but I know there's a lot of politics around that. And, <laughs> and that's where, Council is, uh, you know, hopefully we're making opens the doors on that kind of stuff. Uh, we can make progress. I have a, I think it's kind of a net question, but on the, the printouts, the percentages at the bottom. So the way I read this is the current month expenditure, year to date, total budget original, and then the percentage of budget. It seems like it's inverse. Like it is. Okay. You got to use the word uh, left. So you have, uh, so I always put the word left in front of it. So if I go across to like so our sales tax right here, remaining. we have 55%, well, this is the wrong one, but 50, uh, this is, these are, these are revenue. So like if I go to the other side, yeah, so it's, it's like payroll tax. So yeah, for some yeah, budget, yeah, yeah I was like, to, you, you, the tendency is- And that's where you were saying that Cuthbertson was saying, why aren't all these numbers 50? Yeah, it goes down the line. And yeah. you know, the call should be exactly 50 on December 31st. And you're like, no, that's not really how it works. Yeah, no, it's, I'm looking at the total. Yeah, I'm going to try to zoom in so anybody can see here. But yeah. you know, this one right here, so- Year to date, we spent 5,605 of our budgeted amount 12,040, which means we have 53% of that. 
left. Yes. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I read it. I usually read it the other way, but okay. <laughs> so that I I confuses me every time I look at this thing. I'm like, I have to. And I'm assuming yeah, that contract and services keeps coming up as you know 6,900 percent. Yeah, spent well, because of the the Coleman engineer in the water fund, absolutely. Yeah. In the other funds, we're pretty much on top of yeah, it. Yeah, like yeah. if a contracted, you know, uh, expense <laughs> goes up, we know exactly what that is. In the yeah. water fund, it could be PWA, it could be yeah. uh, you know, uh, Coleman, um, and we we. It's a it's a line item that we always have in our budget. It's always been uh, kind of it's always lived there, but we didn't use it all that much for the last two years. Yeah, now it's really getting a workout. So, counselors, are there other quick questions? I'd like to open up the public comments because I know people have been hanging in and they're cold, and maybe we have some burning questions that will warm us up. Sorry, I'm really <laughs> Man, This is like metaphor night. It's never. <laughs> I think Gabe started out with this one. The water fund continues to leak oil. <laughs> <laughs> like, don't mix. Many questions I don't mix metaphor. <laughs> yeah, you, you missed one of them. Uh, Gabe was talking about septic and said we put the lid on. Yes, I did. I caught it. All right, I'm, well, I'll get back to counselors for more questions, but let me open the public comments. So that if anyone has any comments about the budget, Ms. Thompson, you've been very patient. Thank you. And, I hope you're. I hope you can still move. <laughs> yeah. Um. First of all, thank you, Gabe. I remember last year when I attended the club. So I, I love the role and just the way you explain everything. And um, as we know, uh, budget analysis drives planning and decisions in order to meet our goals here in the business of yeah. Um, and From the presentation and supporting documentation, uh, quote, anticipated year end 2022 spending deficit in the water fund of at least 200,000 and another. 160,000 or more in 2023 if permanent staffing solution isn't. So uh, last year when we, the city first contracted with Coleman Engineering, I stated as well as other water customers that this business decision was unsustainable. Uh, the community was shocked at the monthly charges over 30,000 a month. We were charged by Coleman. We we're also concerned about water rate increases as a result of bringing on Coleman to run our water plant. And at the time at that city council meeting, um, it was stated that our water rates would increase. Of course, I understand that our water rates are going to increase even if we didn't have Coleman. I tried to look up those minutes, but the minutes in the website are just wrong. But I remember it was last year. So my one concern I have is that the water rate increases won't be a direct result of hiring Coleman. Um, but uh, just to continue, uh, that's, I'm sure other people have the same concern. When we talk about living in one's uh, means, we also refer to finances. So, which means since we want to spend less or we want to spend water funds that do not exceed the budget or put us into debt. The questions I have, or and also just maybe some ideas out there. I really don't understand the um, staffing right now, but I do want to know what the short-term and the long-term plans are staffing. So my concern is that we're not in the same situation, say we hire a T3 person, we haven't switched the board, that person leaves, and then we're in the same situation we are now, when we were last year, then we're in trouble again, because we're, again, it's like capacity building where you're not, you're not dependent on one person in that position, where if they leave, we're back to where we were before. So we don't want to, I feel like we don't want to get in that situation again. I understand we had to have a 
C3 operator, but we don't want to be in the same situation again. So maybe we have two or three C3 operators. I'm sure you probably have thought about that. That's probably a plan that I just not aware of the plan. Um, the other issue was, um, I'm just curious, the approximate amount we paid the Coleman engineering. Um, and the other an idea. I don't know if it's possible, but could the state take over our small water system plant? If we can't sustain it, if we can't get the you know, staffing, could we have help from the state? Probably not. Yeah. Um, um, here's another idea. Can we get a waiver from the state with the, with the current staff we have right now? I mean, if we could, I don't know, let's get into that. Yeah, so what are you talking about as far as the waiver? For the T3 operator, what, I just don't understand what the staffing situation is and how do we get home in because they're not in the picture anymore. We're not paying them. So why don't we briefly address that? Uh, oh, no, 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 that's okay. Yeah. I, I just meant we could uh, take, I was. Uh, maybe we could address the staffing in a little more detail because it is in the context of the budget, mm -hmm. if that's okay. And then it sounds like we're also talking a little bit about certification of the plant, whether it's T2, T3. You could, we did talk about that a little bit at LAC. That may be getting a little off topic, yeah. but we can see what we can do. Like, yeah, we well, are a T3 plant, but we're not too far from being a T2 plant. So Coleman is looking at ways where we could possibly become a T2 plan. And then that we wouldn't need to have a T3 offer. So that would mean yeah. speak to your question about a waiver. Right? Then we could have maybe have two, two T2. Yeah. 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 Like, oh, sorry. T2 instead of T2. Yeah. So, so with that way we have it where we're, I just don't want this to happen again. I'm sure none of us do. Yeah. This is really a bad situation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we have, uh, uh, in the process, uh, Coleman has uh, two people that uh, they're talking to as far as taking their exam for T2. And once they take their exam for T2, uh, then they could work with the plan and then eventually become a T3. They're, they're younger and, uh, and uh, you know, we'll see how their potential is. So it'll just be sort of like waiting to see you know how how they can come along. So either way, they're they're trying to move some some people in. They they keep referring to the phrase that they want to work themselves out. Uh, so, but uh, we had a hiccup, unfortunately, where we had uh, a T three that had been working at the plant and uh, and then started working full time since August first, but uh, before January thirtieth, which would have been the end of the six month probationary period. So middle of January, we had to let him go because he didn't fulfill the ex expectations. Uh, so cost is always a consideration, but beyond cost, it's always making sure that the water and the quality is there. Right. Uh, I have a comfort level with uh, Coleman Engineering because they have a good reputation in the state. And uh, the state had apparently stated that uh, that they might have had to step in if we didn't go ahead and have someone like Coleman. And I realize they did make a lot of improvements. Right. Quality. Exactly. It's just the cost was too high. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, it is too so long. Obviously. Right. Yeah. We, we were hoping and they were hoping yeah. that they could have pretty much phased out for the most part. So, so we, we had to basically regroup in January. So and then we were able to get the. Uh, we had the T2 who's currently working. So he was on board before, since September 1st, uh, and under us. He started as an employee of us, and then with Coleman running the plant, he became a Coleman employee. And then September 1st, he came back as our employee. Uh, so that's the T2 one. And then the T3 one was originally signed up with Coleman, is from the area. Yeah, when the, when they were fully operating the plant, and then uh, recently uh, in January we reached out to him and he agreed to work at the plant. So 
And so he is the T3 that's currently working. And uh, he uh, also uh, is currently working with Eureka and Pelican Bay. Uh, and supposedly Eureka is uh, working on getting in another employee so he won't have to work there. Those, uh, I think it's just covering one day there in, in Eureka so that he can dedicate that extra day to us. Uh, but it's still part time because he didn't want to work full time. Uh, so, so we'll see how that all plays out because we, we need to get a, a T3 operator that's a city employee. So that's the goal. We have we have two part-time people, a T2 and a T3. We have, so we're covered right. with Coleman as the backstop as a T3. Mm -hmm. They're not working full-time anymore at a $35,000 a month run rate. So we expect that run rate was like 19,000. We expect it to get to four to five grand. Yeah. And then the idea is to either change the plant rating to T2 so that we you know don't have to have a T3 looking at that option and or you know as Eli said we have two people that are applicants that you know would be our bench so these would be new folks who are going to come in and potentially at least one or two of them to get trained and be longer term in place so we're looking at like now how can we have one or two or three people yeah. on the bench ready to go so if you know because people can leave yeah. and that's tough them, unfortunately All right. but um yeah, so that's, I just wanted to recap because I don't want anybody to sure. work with anything. We, we, you know, we don't have people managing the plant right. as we do right now. Yeah. And, and thank you for arranging that so quickly when this person left. So, yeah. And yeah. And, and, and as far as the T3, T2 portion, uh, it, it probably would be a long shot if we end up being classified as a T2. Yeah. So, so, so at least we're, we're just going to keep looking at a T3, pursuing the T2. But not putting our eggs in that basket because it, it, it would be difficult to get to that stage. Uh, because we're, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was something uh, like uh, possibly mid 40s, and we'd have to get underneath 40, being like 39, the way they do the rating. So, so we were close, but, but we still had a number of points that we'd have to shave off. And, uh, and, and, you know, we, we just, we'll try, but uh, I just don't want that to feel sure. like that's a yeah. feasible well, well, option. Yeah. Well, yeah. What was your other question? Yeah, yeah. so about the, I understand that we're going to have a one room three, I understand that, but, um, but um, are we going to absorb the cost that from Coleman? Is that going to be? No, the, the water. Yeah, yeah, the water rate increase uh, when they do the analysis, we waited because we ideally would have had it done sooner. Sure. Uh, but uh, we waited because we wanted to make sure that things sort of stabilized in some respect so that we wouldn't take in consideration the full cost of Coleman, but rather their contribution being, like uh, Sharon was saying, you know, more in, let's say, all ballpark in 5,000. You know, maybe even four thousand or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I mean, ultimately, I see them as being like uh, a backup, so that at any point where any resources needed, our people can call them, ask them questions, and, and someone is there to make sure things keep running well as they are right now. I meant that um, for the uh, water customer. Oh yeah, no. As, as far as the water customer, is that going to be independent of all the we get well, it'll it still have probably like in the four to five thousand range per month. Let's let's just say, which would be like maybe around sixty thousand, you know, fifty to sixty thousand, which would be like for coal. Yeah, uh, that's what we're just saying that that may be taken into consideration. Oh, you know, but but by the time they do the whole study, it it, it might end up being only twenty or thirty thousand. It'll still be something. Of, of at least a, a few, that, you know, I, I don't know what the number would be, whether it's 20 or 30, but we'll see. We'll, we'll see how they do it all. Okay. <clears throat> I think we need to yeah, we need move on a bit. Other uh, public comments or questions? Rush ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> 
experience. And this is just from hearing people's secondhand opinions and whatnot. But how many people have cycled, how many city employees have cycled through the water plant or come and gone over the past couple of years? And is that different than the rate of people cycling through other city jobs? That's a good question. Eli, do you want to take that? Yeah. Uh... So we, so other than Coleman, as far as city employees being at the water plant, uh, we had after Ryan and had left. Uh, so we had a total of one, two, three, four that are city employees. So out of those four, two have left the plant okay. and two are still at the plant. Okay. So about a 50% right. attrition in... And this is because we're transitioning. We're transitioning, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we we um, also, I think Eli mentioned, you know, we've in, improved the packet, right? The, maybe we didn't talk about this. It might have been a whack, apologies. But um, we, we have improved the salary package and benefits to aid in retention. I think that's I think that's going to make a big difference. It's it's competitive now. So uh, but we're keeping an eye on it and it's it's important to keep it, bringing it uh, to our attention. It's working. Other questions or comments on the budget? Um, and Gabe, did you have anything you wanted to add? I think I I covered it. We're all cold. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Diane over here is just like, who's freezing in the budget? <laughs> All right, uh, future, we could save money. Yeah, <laughs> we could save it over $17. Anyway, out of a $700,000 budget, Eli, you're so positive. Okay, so we're all on send future agenda items. Anybody have anything they want to uh, add for the future? I'm sure there are already some things on our list, but if there's anything, okay. Um, with that then, we are adjourned. Thank you everyone for hanging in. Thank cool. you.